this computer. All right, we're talking liver health today, which I'm excited about. Liver comes up a lot. Um, one of the things about liver health that's so prevalent is that it's involved in so many different things. And it's actually like our, it's our biggest, largest internal organ. Yeah, Zoom right now. So I'm I'm running this live on Zoom. So if you click the link in my bio, like I said, uh, you can join it. I'm going to be sharing my screen because I like having my notes and I'll share it. So I'll share certain pictures, lists, all fun stuff like that. And I'll eventually post it on YouTube as well. But I'm um, trying to get more consistent, more um, streamlined with a lot of this approach. So um, I was recording these live on YouTube, but kind of with that, oh, there we go. We got some people coming in. Um, but there were some issues with the mic, and I think it's just easier if I, um, you know, do it this way. So if you want to come in, join using the link, and uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so liver. Why is liver so important? Like I mentioned, it's actually our largest internal organ, believe it or not, because it's got a lot of jobs. There's a lot going on with the liver. Um, it's got four main functions. Um, th there's a lot, but it, you could classify them really into like four or five main categories. So, you know, with that, the liver has four main tasks. Let's talk about them. We have storage and distribution of things, converting or creating new materials that we need for a variety of things, generating bile, and then of course, detoxification. Now you can argue there's a fifth, which is metabolism of your amino acids, your carbohydrates and fatty acids. You can absolutely argue that. So you could call it five, but those are the primary big picture functions. And then of course, there are a bunch of micro jobs like in between that as far as be, uh, certain reactions and stuff. But if we take a look and I will, Share my screen here. Take a look at what the liver kind of looks like. Let me, can I zoom in? Bear with me as I uh, work through this here. So we have the liver here, which is this large organ, mostly on the right side of the abdomen. Um, and it, like I said, it's pretty large. If you feel, especially in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. So we got a couple more people coming in. Um, if you have pain kind of almost under the rib cage on the right side, usually that's going to be related with liver. And if you actually have any right shoulder pain, especially like on the posterior side, sometimes that can be related to liver and gallbladder as well. So we have the liver here and there's a lot of different blood vessels that are going to bring a variety of different things to that. Then we have this green organ, which is our gallbladder which is kind of like a sac that's nestled under the liver, which is where bile is essentially stored. Um, and then from there, it's gonna come down this green, and maybe I'll zoom in a little more here, this green kind of tube here, this green vessel, and enter into the intestines. And you'll see, unfortunately, this isn't a great picture for it, but if it actually connects with uh, with the pancreas here. So these actually uh, connect and what's called the common bile duct. And then you have pancreatic enzymes, you have uh, bile and, and all these other things that kind of come in to help aid with digestion after the stomach uh, finishes up with food. So that's kind of one part. I have another picture here that I know I'm skipping ahead, but this is important. So there, there's blood vessels, as you notice, and the red are going to be arteries, the blue are going to be veins, as generally speaking, they are. Um, but you'll notice the liver actually has a separate venous system. It's called the portal system, where it actually collects blood from the entire digestive tract. That's what these blue veins are. So this is the entire colon. It's connected to the small intestine, and it's going to collect all of that blood so it can process it that way before it gets out into the rest of the body. So any sort of toxins that need to go through, anything that needs to be processed through the liver, there is a direct connection to the gut. Um, and there is also uh, to the stomach, to the small intestine, to the colon, all of these are gonna be filtered 
to the liver uh, for processing. And like I said, um, you know, we have four main processes that we that we go through: storage, distribution, converting, generating bile, detoxification. And you could argue this is the fifth, which is metabolism in general. Um, although really it's more these. So let's look at some liver disease stats here that we got. Um, and these are from government websites. What's going on, Christine? Um, we have roughly one in 10 Americans have some form of liver disease every year. Almost 20,000 people die from just liver cancer. Um, we have almost 50,000 a year die from liver cirrhosis. Now, cirrhosis is kind of end-stage liver damage. Um, you can actually regenerate your liver for quite a while, but at least the conventional theory is that once you get to cirrhosis or scarring of the liver, it's that that's where it becomes irreversible. Now, personally, I have not seen cirrhosis reverse, uh, but that cirrhosis is not something that just appears. That's something that takes years and years to kind of come on and and uh, develop. So you have a lot of time there. So if we look at fatty liver disease, you'll see it in this picture here, of course, a diagram. Um, you know, this is what a healthy liver looks like. Generally, you're looking for that kind of like dark brownish red type of color. That's going to be a, a picture of a healthy liver. Um, you can check it, by the way, it's under true health Thursday. Like you can see the title here. Uh, you join the link, you'll get it. You'll send get sent an email with the link and you can pop on. We got a few people on right now. So, um, so it might be a better way and I'll hang out for a few minutes. So with that, um, generally speaking though, if the liver starts getting injured, you might see fat deposits in the liver and that will start to turn it a little yellow. Now it's not going to become a this type of yellow although if you look up some livers i can actually look up disease the liver images see google's still good for something but i can show you so this might be a little bit graphic but it tends to get a lot brighter um a lot more obviously nodular you kind of see that here so you see, this is a healthy liver. We have kind of that reddish brown. This is a more cirrhosis one. You'll see the scarring, the nodules appear. It gets harder too. So the liver, generally speaking, it's it's dense, but it's soft. Uh, a cirrhosis liver, which I've actually touched in anatomy lab back in the day, it's very firm. Like it has, it has much less give. Um, and obviously it, its color is way off. So that's kind of what it looks like. What's actually happening is you get a buildup of these fat cells in the liver tissue and this now is actually happening in more people that are um not even they're, they're actually having uh, it used to be i guess i should say it this way it used to be alcoholic fatty liver disease was the most common form of liver disease now it's actually non-alcoholic in other words it's not caused by alcohol and what's happening is we're getting fatty deposits fatty cellular tissue deposited in the liver uh, in the liver. So when we're, and of course it's not due to alcohol. So these are in people who don't drink or don't drink very heavily. Generally it will be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is what's happening. Um, they begin to bloat swell. So I, I know it doesn't look like it in this picture, but generally fatty livers are going to be a little bit enlarged. That's why you might get a little bit of pain that goes along with it. Um, so that is going to be a big part of it too. Um, what this causes is obviously an increase in inflammation. There's going to be an increase in uric acid levels. So you're, you're again, you're creating an acidic environment in the body and it become it leads to eventually cell death where you get scarring, cirrhosis, and now you have really damaged uh, cells on the back end. So that's part of it. And again, if you were looking at it now, prior to 1980, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease basically didn't exist or it was very, it was in very small amounts. Today, and again, it, uh, this is, you know, a, a article I pulled up, uh, one of the main chronic non-communicable diseases in many parts of the world. Um, it affects somewhere between a quarter to almost a half to two out of every five American adults, 60% of which are men. 
Um, and the rates have doubled in the last 20 years. Again, kind of goes back to what we were talking about in 1980, and they continue to rise. So we have a lot going on as, as far as that goes um, in terms of like, is this really a problem? Now, we also know um, that roughly 20%, 25% um, of non-alcoholic fatty liver is usually, there's comorbidities with things like obesity, type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, so uh, cholesterol is high for some reason, uh, hypertension, metabolic syndrome. All of these things kind of create a constellation where we tend to have some issues. Now, what happens next? Let me pull up this image here. Um, is there's a second type, which is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, um, which will be called NASH, uh, which is kind of like a slightly more severe version of fatty liver. Uh, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways. You kind of see it here. Here, I'll share my screen again. So you kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, so you can see that here in this picture. So NASH is basically, so fatty liver, you're just getting fat accumulation. Um, in NASH, you're start getting the, the initial version of scarring. So you'll see some scarring marks in, in, in a, uh, a NASH, someone with a NASH diagnosis liver, if you want to call it that. And then cirrhosis is true scarring, which what we showed you before. Now, the interesting part is you, this is reversible. This is reversible. This, again, according to conventional theory, is not. Um, and I will say, again, at least to date, I haven't seen complete cirrhosis heal, although at the same time, these are usually the folks that let it get to that point and are probably not super interested in healing unless until it's too late. Um, so, you know, that is sometimes the case, like with that. So just so you get an idea, like a visual of what's going on. So of the people who have fatty liver, roughly 20% or so end up developing NASH if they continue to put it off, if they continue to not make the improvements they need to make. And 20% of the folks with NASH, again, if they continue down this path of ignoring it, not doing what they need to, to start regenerating and healing the liver, then they end up with cirrhosis. So that's ultimately kind of what's going on, what, what that timeline, you know, kind of looks like as far as that goes. So there's that. Um, oh, we have no one coming in. So what are some of like the big symptoms? I'll share, share a list here uh, that come along with liver dysfunction, right? Like what, how are we going to know what, what, what's going on? So let me share this again. So we'll go over what's happening and then important, more importantly, the why. So generally speaking, especially like in the beginnings of it, it, the, the initial development of, of challenges with the liver, usually there actually might not be too many symptoms. You might get like vague pain in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. Sometimes it could be fatigue, but generally speaking, it's very mild. However, like over time, again, if you ignore it or aren't making any changes, you're going to get other things. So we have things like weakness, uh, unexplained weight loss, potentially. Uh, usually it goes the other way, but it can happen. Uh, nausea, vomiting, you're going to get yellowing of the eyes. This is what we call jaundice. Um, we have swelling in the legs and enlarged spleen. Sometimes you get red palms or clammy palms. Sometimes you get easy bruising. There, there's other symptoms that come along with liver dysfunction, uh, but these are some of the big ones. Sometimes it can be skin breakouts, acne, things of that nature, all could do that. So why does the liver need support? Well, we're, we live in an environment now that is more, uh, how do I put this, toxic than any other environment that we've kind of ever been in. We now live in a world in America where we have depleted soils, right? Like we have about one one percent, I believe I've seen, um, and I believe I got this from Zach Bush. So you correct me, but roughly one percent of the topsoil here in America is actually considered nutrient dense. This is largely due to conventional farming practices. It's due to 
uh, the use of herbicides, pesticides like like glyphosate, big issue. Stress, smoking, processed foods, the 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 four whites. Um, so white sugar, white flour, white salt. Um, those are three. Sorry, three. <laughs> um, just poor nutrition in general. Alcohol, coffee, energy drinks, caffeine, uh, prescription drugs, which are not on here, uh, but they're further down all of which are going to deplete the liver over time. So that's gonna play a huge role with it. Um, now, like I said before, we have kind of this whole system of veins that are going to come through the, the liver to filter uh, a lot of blood. So we have the portal vein, which is actually going to come, uh, we, have, uh, we have from the, uh, the mesentery. So if we go go back up here, Mesentery is going to be basically your digestive tract. So all of these kind of collect into the portal vein. Then that blood is going to be filtered through the liver. So that's kind of what's going on with that as far as function. And then once it's cleaned, now we have something we can do. So like I mentioned, liver has four primary responsibilities, and we're going to go through those. So again, storage distribution, creating materials that you need. It's going to be converting bile and it's going to be detoxification. So very quickly, like storage and just distribution is very straightforward. Um, so it's going to store things. Think of this like uh, uh, like glucose, for example. So it can be stored as glycogen. That not happens in the liver, but it primary actually, primarily actually happens in uh, muscle tissue. This is essentially your initial reserve energy stores. But it can also store things like fat-soluble vitamins. So that's vitamins A, D, E, and K. It can store minerals like iron and copper uh, for when they're needed. So there's a lot of different things that the liver can do as far as storage. And then when you need them, for example, when you need energy like uh, you know glucose, if you are in a sympathetic state and you need to move around, it will break off the glucoses from the glycogen stack. And it can be shuttled then to muscles or whatever need it. So that's actually a really nice utilization. The second major function of the liver is going to be converting and synthesizing what you need. So um, if we take the glucose example again, when there is excess glucose in the blood, uh, for whatever reason, say you ate, say you're in a stressed state, the liver then takes that excess glucose, it turns it, and it stores it as glycogen, which all glycogen is, is essentially taking a bunch of glucose molecules and attaching them together, stacking them together to have less of a mess. It's essentially like taking a, 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 a file cabinet and instead of having a mess of files. And in this case, each file would be a glucose molecule. You put them all together and they fit neatly in one cabinet. That's essentially what glycogen is. Um, it also converts things like excess protein into urea, which you can then excrete via the kidneys. So, you know, that is a big thing too, especially when we're talking about acidic buildup, when the, when the two primary causes of all disease are going to be acidity and toxicity. If we're in an acidic environment, if we're in a toxic environment, the liver needs to work through a lot of those acidic byproducts so we can get to a place where we can start healing. So that is another big part. Um, it also uh, synthesizes things. So the liver primarily is going to be where cholesterol is made. This is important. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, cholesterol. Um, another big thing, we talked about bile production. Now, bile in and of itself has like four major functions. It's going to help break down fatty, uh, metabolize fatty acids. So emulsify fats into the individual fatty acids so we can absorb them. It's going to excrete waste products. So, you know, bile is a way to get rid of waste products so they can be eliminated through the bowels. Um, it's going to help restore balance to the microbiome. So actually bile in and of itself actually has antimicrobial properties. So if there happens to be some microbes that shouldn't make it past the stomach, bile can actually help sort some of that out. And then it also helps balance blood sugar. So um, it also because it is a fat emulsifier, is going to help with the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, again, A, D, E, and K. So proper bile production is crucial. And this is why the gallbladder itself is not a 
replaceable organ. It's not uh, something, you know, you could just take out because it doesn't feel good one day. Although it happens all the time, you know, if that's the case, that is going to affect fat digestion indefinitely. If you have, if you're taking out organs, we are not born with extra pieces, with optional pieces. They all serve a purpose. There's a reason for it. Uh, finally, then, is, of course, detoxification. Now, the liver, the primary cells of the liver are called Kuffer cells, K-U-P-F-F-E-R, uh, I believe is how you spell it. And these are essentially the cells that do, that perform these detoxification mechanisms in the body. So again, high acid products, which are going to be from toxic chemicals, drugs, alcohol, caffeine, processed foods, white sugar, white salt, um, all of these things need to be detoxified by the liver in real time. So with that, we need to make sure that these cells are working as well as they could be. If they're not, we really need to, you know, figure out what that is. Is it a toxic overload? Is it something in the environment that we're not addressing? Usually that's diet related. Um, or is it something, you know, in the house like that you need to address? Or is it medications? All, medic all medications need to be cycled through the liver at some point so that you can get rid of them. Everything from your Tylenol to your birth control to your uh, you know, stomach acid lowering medications, everything, all of it needs to go through that process. So how does blood get from the intestines? We talked about the portal system to the liver. So this happens, essentially, we have these villi and these are like finger-like projections that come out of the small intestine. And there's so many of them. If you were actually to flatten out the entire small intestine, it would take up enough surface area to fill up a tennis court, which is pretty wild. So we have all these micro, um, almost like tendrils that kind of come out. We can't see them with the naked eye, but as you zoom in, you can see them and it increases the surface area that much to help increase absorption, which is incredible. It really is. But like when we're talking about detoxification, I got to share this with you. And unfortunately, this image is a little blurry, but bear with me here. So this is one I've actually used in many presentations in the past. And I think I'm going to start writing more so you'll probably see it a lot more. So again, might be tough to read because this is a pixelated version. Maybe I could find a better one. Quickly. Uh, this one isn't as good, but it's probably clearer. Yeah, we'll just use this for now. So, and I don't know why it's phased with an F, but we're gonna we're gonna work through that together. So the liver has to basically cycle through everything, and there's really two main phases. Phase three essentially is getting rid of the waste through kidneys. Uh, via urine, through the bile and colon, via stool, or via sweat, through the skin, or breath. Phase one, we need a variety of different antioxidants, nutrients. This isn't probably the best picture for that, but it'll help. And then really, you're taking these fat-soluble toxins. This is what the liver does. It takes fat-soluble things, turns them into water-soluble things, so they can ultimately be excreted via, excuse me, bile, kidneys, colon, skin, breath. That is big picture what's happening. That includes any environmental toxins, junk food, again, alcohol, caffeine, food additives, drugs, pesticides, all of it, all of these fat soluble toxins need to go through the liver at some point. So this might be a better one as far as the specifics. No. See, this is why, oh, this is a better one. Okay. But like, we need a lot of things for phase one and phase two here. So all these different B vitamins, vitamin C, so, uh, you know, certain herbs obviously can help. But even in the second one, we need specific amino acids like glutamine and lysine. These are things that actually make up glutathione. If you actually look, uh, you know, taurine, cruciferous vegetables, all these things are going to help with either phase one or phase two. So, you know, this is really where 
it's going to make a big difference as far as what you're doing, what you're putting in your body. Are you lightening or adding to that load potentially? So there's a lot that the liver has to handle, especially in the modern world. Now, blood is obviously really important here too, because that is what the liver is cleaning, right? Um, and by the way, if you could just mute yourself by any chance, that would be great. Um, much appreciated, seriously. Um, so, um, so yeah, so blood cells, generally speaking, have a, a shelf life, red blood cells, I should say, have a shelf life of anywhere between 90 to 120 days. This is why if you get a hemoglobin A1C test, what is being tested is actually uh, a certain marker that attaches to red blood cells and it stays on them essentially for the, the, the lifespan of that red blood cell. And since red blood cells, again, have a lifespan of 90 to 120 days, when those get recycled, then that percentage will change every every 90 to 120 days. That's the concept behind testing hemoglobin A1C. So, um, so that's an important part as far as red blood cells are concerned, but also like how are they produced? So this is actually important and I'll share my screen again. By the way, if you guys could let me know in the chat, if you're liking the way this is going, I'd love to know because um, I hope this is more helpful, like going through it and sharing my screen. I know there's a lot of information and it's fast, but um, there is a point to it. So that's where we're, we're at with red blood cells. Red blood cells get um, you know, produced. Uh, they're stimulated when there is low oxygen in the body. Um, what happens is there's a hormone called erythropoietin, which is then produced. Uh, this stimulates the creation, essentially, of red blood cells. Um, and this is also what helps regulate blood pH. Now, blood pH is in a very tight range. It only stays between 7.35 and 7.45. If you get outside that range, death starts to occur. Seriously. So it is a very tight range that this is held in. Now, we have buffers on either side of that, particularly on the alkaline side. They tend to get used up a lot. Um and it, maybe this is a better way to kind of look at it. So what happens is if there's a lack of oxygen, this is usually sensed by the kidneys. The kidneys are what create erythro, erythropoietin. That, that goes to the red blood cells, the bone marrow. That's where your red blood cells are made. It increases the production of red blood cells. And then the kidneys will shut off the production of erythropoietin until it's needed again. So this is the cycle of kind of how it works in the body. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, now, the kidneys obviously are really important because this is where your erythropoietin and uh, the, the, the blood cycle is going to take place. So the kidneys, and this is why, where diuretics come in. So the kidneys, a lot of drugs actually target the nephron of the kidneys, particularly diureta, diuretics. Now, nephrons are essentially very tiny and they could eventually get plugged if there's inflammation. And if they die that becomes an issue. And I want you to think about this. So diuretics, sometimes you'll take for high blood pressure. Imagine, say, you have three routes that water can flow through, one, two, three. But say one gets plugged. What happens to the other two? The pressure is going to go up, right? Because you have 100% of the fluid, instead of going 33, 33, 33, it's now 50, 50. So the pressure is going to be more. What is the response generally in the conventional space? It's to give another blood pressure medication, not fix the problem. And what you're seeing is these continue to get plugged. So it becomes a real cyclical issue here. Now, kidney failure in general is becoming more and more common as we've seen the rise, particularly of blood sugar, insulin issues with diabetes. Kidney disease has basically tailed along with it. Um, a lot of folks, a lot of folks really struggle with kidney weakness. And what I find personally is that kidney weakness is probably one of the most common things that I see that is often overlooked. And we don't have too many markers that we use on typical blood tests. But what we do have with that is, you know, it is something that we need to you to, to on a regular basis make sure are filtering properly. But if they're proper, uh, they're constantly getting gummed up. 
by different medications or sluggish for some reason, it's going to cause real issues. Now, here's something. I know I keep unsharing and sharing, but again, important stuff. Now, this is wild. So this is actually something that I found in the last few years. I have a couple pictures here, but bear with me because this isn't really important in my opinion. So when I went to school, and I'm sure many of you, if you ever took like A and P classes or or even biology to some degree, you're taught that lymphatic. And why is the why are the kidneys important? Because that is where lymphatic vessels actually flow. And that's the point I'm working towards because that is not something that we learn in school. And by the way, if you're on Instagram and you're not joining to actually see what I'm talking about, this is important. Um, so came across the study that came out a few years ago, and I could share it later if someone asks. But what they found was that there we're, we're taught that lymphatic system, the lymphatic system, lymph, lymph nodes dump lymph back into the blood supply so that it can be excreted as waste. That doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense if you think about it, because we really have two fluid systems. I've talked about this over and over again on this channel. We have blood, which effectively functions as the kitchen. It delivers the oxygen. It delivers the glucose. It delivers the nutrients to the cells that need the specific thing so that they can do their job. The lymphatic system, which is actually 80% of the fluid in our body, functions as the bathroom. It is the toilet. We get... Just like we go to the bathroom to get rid of wastes in, in the form of urine and stool, our cells use up the nutrients that are brought by blood, create metabolic wastes with the rest, but need a way to filter it out. The lymphatic system is the way that it filters out. Now, like I said, traditionally, we're taught that the lymphatic system dumps back into the blood supply. But if you ever tried to build a house or 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 lived in a house, would you literally want to poop where you eat? No. So you, you wouldn't want to do that in the kitchen. If you ask any, you know, contractor, you you want to keep these things separate, separated. So what they actually found a few years ago is actually there are lymph vessels that follow, trace the veins and arteries that go to the kidneys. And what they actually found is that these lymph vessels, I'll try to zoom in a little more here to make this a little easier to see, is that the lymphatic fluid can actually get circulated out through the kidneys. So through uh, you know, the lymphatic, we uh, sorry, the lymphatic, the kidney, we have the 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 kidney medulla. Um, you can even see that in this picture on the right. We have lymphatics that go through the kidney. So then that makes more sense because it functions like your kitchen or sorry, like your bathroom. You can then have all of these lymphatics get cycled out through the kidneys and then ultimately come out through the urine, which is what we have here. So you can see how the lymphatics, we have the arteries here in red, we have the veins here in blue, and we have the lymphatics here in green. And they all mimic each other. How fascinating is that? And now this is something that just came out a few years ago. And I've had a couple mentors talk about like there's no way the lymphatics actually dump themselves back into the blood. This is actually evidence that that's true. That it actually gets cycled out through the kidneys. So how fascinating is that? And you would think like in 2023, we assume we know all the, 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 the players that we have in the game. We don't. Fascinating stuff, really, like it, 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 in my opinion. But it also, this is what's so important about the kidneys and the lymphatic system as a whole. Because if we don't show them the support that they need, it becomes a major, major issue down the road. Now, let's come back to cholesterol quick. And here, and what cholesterol does, first of all, there's only one cholesterol. We, everyone talks about HDL cholesterol and LDL. There's only one cholesterol. There are multiple different types of carriers of cholesterol. And this is what it is. Everyone talks about good cholesterol. Everyone talks about bad cholesterol, but that's not actually what happens. What happens is, is we have two main types. We have LDL, low-density lipoproteins, and HDL, high-density. 
LDL brings cholesterol from the liver to the tissues, wherever it needs to go. HDL does the opposite. It brings cholesterol from the tissues back to the liver. That is it. That's what's going on. So I don't know why it became such a huge thing, but taking a statin or something to lower cholesterol just because it's high is stupid. All it means is that there is some form of inflammation because there's only a few ways that we deal with as high acid load, which acid you can translate as inflammation. We talked about that a few weeks ago. There's four ways that you deal with that. It's water, fat, cholesterol, and then minerals, usually calcium, but other alkalizing minerals. Cholesterol is one of those. That helps alkalize the an injured area. So saying cholesterol is causing heart disease or causing placking in arteries is the equivalent of showing up to the scene of a fire, seeing the fire truck with the fireman and saying, huh, the fireman must have caused the fire. That is actually what's going on. Cholesterol is not there to cause the damage or, or even or in any case. What's happening is it's actually helping clean it up. That's why the LDLs get high. It brings cholesterol from the liver to tissues for healing purposes. So that is really what is going on here. Now, why is it stupid to take a statin just to lower cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is actually the backbone to building every single hormone in your body. So let's talk about, and I should have had this one up. I didn't, but let me get this up quick. Um, let me see, cholesterol, how do no, that's not what I want. It's actually a precursor to so many different hormones. And I'm going to intentionally share this. It's going to look a little convoluted. But you need to understand what's going on, and I'll break it down for you if I find a good picture here. You find like a semi-simple one to just make it a little bit easier. Okay, let's do, let's do this one. So let me share this again. Screen two. Okay, so cholesterol made in the liver. You can see here, progesterone, cortisol, might have heard of that. Estrone, estradiol, estriol, testosterone, DHEA, all things you might have heard of. These are all precursors, or sorry, come from a backbone of what is known as cholesterol. You can even see that here. There's probably a better picture for it if it clears up. Um, that's not going to clear up, is it? Uh, oh, no, actually, this is a good one. You could see it's the cholesterol backbone. All that's happening at each of these steps is there, is there are slight differences, but you need the cholesterol backbone for sex hormones or stress hormones. Like, so taking something just to lower it because something's high is at best a stupid move. I hope that's becoming clear here. So with that in mind, I know we got a lot going on here. Um, your liver actually creates somewhere between 75 and 90% of all the cholesterol we need. And like I said, it is, and as you can see, it is the backbone for all your sex hormones, all your uh, corticosteroids, all your aldosterones. That is what you need it for. You also need it for bile production. You need it for uh, healthy cell membranes. You It coats your skin. Um, it actually uh, is part of the brain. You need it for healthy brain function. Uh, you need it, again, for sex hormones, progesterone. All of these need cholesterol. So just seeing cholesterol high does not necessarily mean much of anything other than the fact that there might be some inflammation somewhere. And where is it? Well, if you have a good practitioner, those are the questions you need to ask or learn how to get to the bottom of it. That's part of my job. That's what I do. So, and just for one more visual, again, I know I'm, going, I'm jumping back and forth with this, but it's important. 
So here's just like a general look at oops, a bunch of different types of uh, lipoproteins here. So we have the HDL, high density, denser. You could even see it in the text on the bottom. I know that might be tough to read, but I'll zoom up. Uh, principal function, transport of excess cholesterol from all non-liver cells back to the liver for excretion. Did I just say that? Um, they are the prime for LDL. Like it, it's going to do a similar thing in the opposite direction. So, you know, it, it tells you kind of like what's going on. That's pretty much what is going on in this section. Now we see here, Oops, in the second picture is kind of the makeup of each of these roughly. So, you know, in HDL, 50% of the total structure is protein. Um, in LDL, you're going to have a higher percentage of it being cholesterol because you want to bring cholesterol to wherever it needs to go. So that's the difference between the two. Hope that makes sense. Now, what are the toxins that might cause issues with the kidneys, with the liver? Rx not drugs, drugs, <laughs> heavy metals, things like amalgam fillings, sedentary lifestyle, caffeine and alcohol, chronic inflammation, or if you're, if, you're un, if you're undergoing chronic infections all the time, that is a sign that something's backed up. Genetically modified foods, herbicides and pesticides can go along with that. Artificial sweeteners, seed oils, pesticides, already mentioned that. Processed foods, other synthetic food products. We're seeing what's coming on with lab grown meat and, and even like the plant-based garbage beyond burgers. Stay away from all that nonsense. Uh, predatory fish is, are a big one, particularly for mercury. So especially fish higher on the uh, food chain and farm raised fish. So if they're not wild. Uh, other toxic environmental stimuli, uh, things that start with a V that we can't talk about. Um, at least until I start, I stop share, uh, recording. <laughs> um, so all of these are going to do it. And then we have Tylenol. So Tylenol is just one example. So Tylenol, something that roughly one third of all Americans take and roughly 20 billion doses of Tylenol are purchased or given out each year. And it actually acetaminophen or Tylenol overdoses are the number one cause of acute liver failure in the US. And it's responsible for over 56,000 people per year going to the emergency room. Just Tylenol alone is responsible for over 56,000 people or 56,000 visits to the emer emergency room every year. Wild stuff. So, and then we have like an energetic component to the liver. So if any of you are familiar with like uh, Chinese medicine, and I kind of did a little bit of a post on this earlier today um, where we were kind of talking about this, or sorry, yesterday, we were talking about the energetics, like anger is associated with, um, uh, with the liver and gallbladder in that wood element. You can kind of see that again on this wheel here. And again, if you could mute, if you're not on mute for whatever reason, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, I do want to try to post this later. Somewhere. Okay. So with that, you could see on this wheel and you could easily just Google like a TCM or a chart or a time chart. Um, the liver and gallbladder are going to really be most functional at in the middle of the night. And this actually kind of makes sense because that's when your body's regenerating. That's when it's detoxifying. That's when you're building for the next day. So when the liver is most active is actually 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. energetically speaking. And you can see this is when you should be in deep sleep. The golden hours of sleep, 10 p.m. to roughly like 3 or 4 a.m., those are the prime, prime hours. I'm sure a bunch of you listening to this are love going to fight with me and say, oh, no, I'm a night owl. It's in my genes. It, it's it's a trained habit and you can be trained out of it. The what If you're having struggle regenerating or you're having trouble getting sick all the time, start with getting the sleep at the best time for us, which at minimum is between 10 and around 4 a.m., 10 p.m. and 4 a.m wherever you live. So why? Because again, liver, gallbladder, lung, this is all going to be, these are all detoxification pathways at the end of the day. 
So really important there. Now the liver itself is responsible for the flow of things like emotions in the body, chi or life force and blood, which we kind of make sense. And it's kind of wild if you think about it, thousands of years ago, people had like without doing these dissections kind of had an idea of this. And now it being, now we have done these types of things and it kind of comes through, which is kind of kind of wild if you think about it um, at the end of the day. But uh, there are certain things energetically that are associated with the liver. So the eyes, actually, there are sensory organs associated with, with each element and the liver, gallbladders, wood. The eyes are the sensory organ. The tendons, not necessarily the muscles, but the tendons, which are more, again, in TCM, associated with agility, strength, flexibility, quickness, flexibility. I said flexibility twice um, in that way. There's a taste associated with it, which is sour. So if you're craving like sour foods, that could be a sign that something's off with the liver. If you're getting maybe not necessarily muscle aches, but tendon aches or weak tendons, that could be a sign something potentially is going on with the liver. Anger, which is what I talked about from an energetic standpoint, huge, huge association with the liver. So if you're holding on to, and it's not the emotion of anger that's bad, it's the repressing of it. In other words, you're not actually feeling what you need to, to move on. So if you bury it inside you and over time, you, you don't resolve it, you, it festers. That's when it becomes an issue. So that in and of itself can actually cause pain and issues with the liver. Another way from an energetic standpoint, you can start healing is with acupressure. And one of the best ways to kind of like reset the liver um, meridian is actually using liver three, which is an acupuncture point, which I will um, share quickly. You kind of see that here. Um, you can see, so it starts kind of at the inside of the big toe and it, it's kind of like up the inside, almost in line or in between the first and second toe as you go towards the ankle on the top of the foot. So that's where liver three is. And you could Google pictures if you want, but if that's tender or you feel like something might be going on with the liver using some acupressure, which you can do by yourself at your home, you could you could absolutely get some improvement with that. Um, so where do we start? How do we start healing? I posted this a few days ago, maybe last week. Starting to regenerate and detoxify is the answer. So from a nutrition standpoint, this is where we start. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the big part is getting off of this bottom layer. All the irritants, all the things that are going to add to the acidic load of the body. Yes, that includes dairy. Yes, that includes meat. Yes, that includes eggs. All of these uh, cheese, refined sugars, all of these are going to be in that mode, in that methodology. Refined grains, refined sugars are all going to fall into this, the processed oils. If we can get off that, we can start. I mean, you're always detoxifying to some degree, but if you're constantly adding to that acidic load, it's going to be a big issue. If we could at least get to this part of the triangle, you could see massive improvements. It'll be slower than going up here, but they, it will be very, very, very significant. So that would be where I would start. And you could screenshot that or you could check it out on YouTube and screenshot it later. I actually saw a typo in there. So I'll actually have to go back and fix it. Uh, you have to support your detox organs. What are those? The liver and the blood, the kidneys, the gut, the lymphatic system. All of them are connected because this is functionally your sewer system. And we got four ways to get rid of toxins. We have pee, poop, sweat, and breathing. Actually, breathing is how you get rid of most toxins. That's actually why I came up with the breathwork course uh, or a big reason. So many people don't understand the basic mechanics of breathing healthfully, um, and it goes a long way. But as far as foods, that would be helpful. Specific foods, and I, you could go back to the triangle if you want, it, it, to the detox triangle if you really want to check it out. But apples, beets, carrots, celery, um, what else, what else, what else? Uh, garlic, garlic is fantastic. Uh, lemon, radishes, as far as herbs, aloe vera, fantastic for the, for the liver and the gut itself. Burdock root, chlorella and spirulina, some of my favorites. Um, and you can see, I actually have some of my favorites for chlorella and spirulina in uh, 
the Healing Inside and Out Library, which you can check out if you get if get my book. Um, dandelion root, fantastic. Um, essential oils that can be helpful for the liver. So uh, fennel, geranium, grapefruit, lavender, uh, lemongrass, orange, rosemary, sage, sandalwood, spearmint, all of these are going to be liver supporting at the end of the day. But primarily the cruciferous vegetables, the fruits, the, the raw vegetables are going to be your primary healers along with some of those herbs I mentioned, da dandelion, uh, burdock root, I mean, any of the docks, yellow dock is gonna be good. Um, cloves, garlic, onion, all of them fantastic cleansers for the liver. Citrus, all citrus, grapefruit, lemon, orange, fantastic options, all gonna be helpful for the liver. At the same time, you have to limit your exposure. You can't constantly be exposing yourself to the same things over and over and over again and expecting to get better. You need to start eliminating some of that out. So a lot of that is from this, this conventional food supply with glyphosate, with, um, with herbicides and pesticides and, and a lack of nutrition coming from the conventional food supply. And this is why I walk people through different types of detoxification programs. So if you want to work with me, you could check out the link in my bio. If you want to set up a call, we can go through in iris analysis, see which what might be the best place for you to start and then get you kickstarted that way. If you want to start your own 30 day cleanse, you can also do that, too. And you can message me kind of after this. and I could send you the information if that's something you want. Um, but ultimately, that's how you get started. It's making sure you're sweating every day, making sure we're having bowel movements every day, making sure we're getting the fiber and nutrients we need for the liver to do its job while simultaneously taking the things that are going to make you sick out. That's the fundamentals. So I hope that makes sense. I'm going to at least stop recording here. Um, and maybe I could answer like a question or two before I go. And then that'll be that. So.